Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our Light of Kailash lecture series. And thank you all for joining us this evening. And thank you to our speaker, Julia Hirsch, who's here with us tonight. Um, I won't say much. Uh, Julia is a PhD candidate at Stanford University, and she's focusing on Indo-Tibetan Buddhism. And uh, I've seen several of her articles uh, on the magazine Tricycle, where she continues to serve as a contributing editor, uh, focusing on Buddhist art, film, and publishing. So without further ado, I'll let Julia start, and we'll have some questions at the end of her talk in about 45 minutes to an hour. So. If you have any questions, please write them in the chat or keep them for the end. And welcome everybody. And thank you, Julia. And uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jamyang. Uh, let's see, we might have a few more stragglers, but I'll maybe get going. Um, let me share my screen. Hang on. Um, and I'll ask everyone if they can see the PowerPoint. Can I get some nods if you can see? Hold on, let me share that. Okay. Thumbs up? Great. Okay. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. This is actually my first talk on Zoom, so forgive me uh, for any awkwardness. I've never talked in front of a camera or to um, kind of disembodied faces for so long, but I'm really excited to share all uh, or a little snapshot of some of the research I've been doing at Stanford. As Jamyan said, I'm a, a PhD student. I'm in my third year um, and I'm working on Tibetan Buddhism and material religion, uh, focusing on relics um, and especially whole body relics, which I'll uh, be talking to you about today. Um, and just another thanks for, for joining us. You're welcome to keep your uh, cameras on or off and um, feel free to uh, post any questions in the chat. I'll try to keep track of things that are coming in. Um, if you have any questions or want to share any links or resources, you're welcome to do that. Um, and yeah, so the last time I was uh, in London was right before the pandemic. And I think my um, last pre-pandemic memory was being at Shengshun with Jamyang. So um, it's, wonder it's a wonderful kind of full a uh, full circle moment to be back with you all tonight, even though it's it's virtual. Um, anyways, my talk today, uh, the making of whole body relics in Tibetan Buddhism has grown out of questions that I've been exploring as part of my PhD dissertation um, on whole body relics and bodily substances in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, my interest in the special dead actually transpired um, a few years back during an encounter with the mummified body of Trulshik Rinpoche, uh, a Nyingma master who fled from Tibet to Nepal after the 1959 Chinese invasion. And in the late 60s, uh, Trulshik founded this monastery um, south of Mount Everest called Tukten Choling, and maybe some of you have been um, it's pretty remote. It's in the Solukumbu region uh, in northeastern Nepal. Let's see. Um, so in August uh, 2019, after a dizzying, you know, 12 hour Jeep ride and a long trek through monsoon torn Himalayan roads, I finally arrived at Tupton Choling. And when I entered the main prayer hall, um, and here's a photo that I took. Uh, at the monastery here, I was invited to circumambulate the mummified body of the founder, whose kudung, or precious body relic, was dressed in robes, gilded, and prominently displayed inside a glass reliquary, where it had been installed seven years earlier. Um, so I stayed for the morning puja and watched as an Indian couple requested healing rites from a senior monk. And as I got up to leave, one of the nuns gifted me 
with a small yellow envelope. Um, I opened it up and found a few salt crystals inside. And the nun explained to me that these were the embalming salts actually used to preserve the body of Trilshik Rinpoche and that they were meant to be consumed. Um, so whether I you know, ingested the salts directly or dissolve them into tea, um, she told me that either way I'd experience a host of benefits for my health and well being. And sadly, I lost uh, those salts on my travels back to the US. Um, not, not the best karma. Uh, I haven't lost sight of the significant questions they raised for me um, about Tibetan methods for dealing with the remains of the special dead and how living bodies are, are transformed into powerful relics. Um, some of these questions are around what these relics do or what they're said to do um, and what kind of transformations they bring about. Also about uh, these potent substances, what do they illustrate about different models of agency and efficacy, how identities are formed, how religious sensibility operates in Tibetan Buddhist societies. Um, and especially this question of how embalming salts, or in Tibetan purza, uh, literally meaning corpse salt, works to blur these distinctions between self and other, past and present, living and dead, human, non-human, and more than human. So today, I'll focus generally on the hands-on work of transforming the corpses of Tibetan Buddhist masters into whole body relics. So I'll focus on three interrelated aspects of this relic making process. The first being the makers, the second being the process of making itself, and then third and more specifically some of the raw materials and environmental conditions that allow and resist certain kinds of making. And to ground this inquiry, um, I'll look at the production of a major relic undertaken by Tibetans and international collaborators in Dharamsala, India in the late 20th century, and maybe some of you have visited um, this particular teacher. Uh, I'll draw on a funerary and meditation manual to sources that I've been looking at um, in my studies that provide step-by-step -step guidelines, these instructions for handling the corpse of Ling Rinpoche, the sixth Ling Rinpoche, who was an influential Geluk hierarch and um, a main tutor to the 13th and 14th Dalai Lamas. And so soon I'll show you how certain materials like salt um, emerge as these potent uh, mortuary or charnel ingredients um, in and beyond the funerary context. Uh, salt in particular wears many hats, so I'll explore some of these in detail by looking at historical vignettes from Tibet and India from the late 17th um, to 20th centuries. Um, I like to approach all of this material um, through the model of thinking with, um, so corresponding with uh, relic makers, the embalming process, and raw materials like salt, mercury, and even milk. Um, this allows for notions of skill and efficacy to kind of emerge in embodied and embedded terms, not just materially abstract uh, or exclusively, you know, doctrinal terms. Um, what also emerges from focusing on process over product is a very grounded view of the sacred um, as made, not given. Um, and so that's one of my main points that I hope to show and share with you today. Um, and I also hope to show that this creative process of making sacred objects like whole body relics entails a kind of partnership between the divine and human, as well as vital materials. Uh, so a bit of background, um, traditions of bodily preservation or mummification have a long history on the Tibetan plateau, um, hearkening back to Tibet's imperial past when royal figures were occasionally mummified, so they were preserved and um, interred in the seventh century. Um, and so technology, ritual technology is used to mummify and enshrine the bodies of religious and political elites have endured over the centuries. Um, and as we'll see, they continue to be adapted uh, by Tibetan Buddhists in diaspora today. But it's 
instances of uh, mummification, so manufacturing whole body relics, are rare. They're definitely the exception and not the rule. Um, I also want to emphasize that this category of the whole body relic is just one type of relic within a much wider, um, colorful, and multifaceted relic tradition. And so whole body relics, they are distinct um, from other kinds of relics like ring cell, these pearl-like uh, crystalline uh, substances that emerge from the crematory fire. Um, but whole body relics are different in that they're enshrined um, in, instead of cremation. So which cremation still remains the kind of normative avenue for producing relics. Um, so we are dealing with something kind of distinct and, and special. Um, this is also very different from the phenomenon of self mummification, which um, might be more idealized in other forms of Buddhism, like Shugendo, forms of Japanese Buddhism and Taoism. Uh, but in the Tibetan case, there are no efforts to either downplay or efface any interventions, uh, very human interventions uh, needed to bring about the desired outcome of preserving the corpse. So now that I've mentioned the rule, kind of in brief, let's look more at the exception. Um, the making of the sixth Ling Rinpoche's whole body relic didn't exactly begin after um, the teacher passed away on December 25th in 1983 uh, in Dharamsala, India, but two weeks after. So during those initial 14 days, uh, while the teacher was in Tukdam, um, or the meditative state between death and rebirth, um, around the clock his attendants uh, guarded his, his precious body. Um, and so it was only with the emergence of certain signs, uh, either physiological or uh, environmental, um, that the attendants deemed uh, Tukdam to be complete. So typically during this transitional liminal state of Tukdam, um, biological processes of decomposition are delayed. Uh, the skin remains supple, you know, the heart area remains warm, and the foul smells of ordinary death are absent. Um, so with Tukdam over, the corpse was now vulnerable to decay and dissolution. So here we're really not dealing with a model of an incorruptible body, um, as we see idealized in other relic traditions. Um, and left to themselves, even the bodies of the Buddhist special dead, um, as we see in these models, will disintegrate. And so this leads to creative tensions, um, where the forces of decay pose very real challenges to those entrusted with handling Ling Rinpoche's corpse. Um, so unlike the dry, high-altitude conditions of Tibet, um, Northern India's wet, hot climate, you know, was not at all conducive to the project of embalming. Um, and so this whole project was, in my opinion, kind of defined by this fundamentally creative tension between the impulse to preserve on the one hand and the forces of decay. Um, and so recognizing these material and environmental constraints um, of racing against the clock, the 14th Dalai Lama Tenzin Gyatso, in his biography of Ling Rinpoche, he says something along the lines of, you know, if we're going to do this, we've got to do it now and very quickly. Um, and to paraphrase another comment he made about the stakes involved, uh, embalming the body as opposed to cremating it, he says, would maximize uh, benefit for living beings and be the most efficacious uh, post-death form for ensuring the longevity of the Buddhist te teachings. Um, and so, uh, very quickly, a guild of specialists was assembled to oversee the funerary arrangements, um, with embalming being the major priority. Uh, the entire process took over three years to complete, um, and it all also took a lot of skilled hands and technical knowledge, or lakse, as Tibetans would say, uh, from very wide domains of medicine and pharmacology, ritual, art, and craft. Um, and so, although the treatment of Ling Rinpoche's corpse faithfully adhered to a set of 
kind of open-ended, loosely prescribed customs, as I'll show you in a bit, what we find in this case um, are very creative responses to um, an unpredictable and inhospitable uh, wet, hot Indian climate. So when brushed up against these limitations, Tibetan specialists um, at the behest of the Dalai Lama welcome the use of modern methods or riksar to complement traditional um, Tibetan embalming techniques. And so I'll, I'll discuss a few of those. Um, that brings us to Lisa Hoffman, pictured here, handling the uh, kudung, the remains of Ling Rinpoche. Uh, so Lisa Hoffman was an American, uh, is an American sculptor and practitioner who worked um, alongside the Tibetan team to create a sculpture modeled after Rinpoche's living likeness to be molded over his body. Um, and she writes in her own account that everything that could go wrong did. Um, you know, for instance, in trying to make a substrate made from resin and fiberglass um, to seal the body from outside moisture, you know, and prevent mildew and things like rot, um, she encountered kind of the messiness of the unexpected. Um, and because Rinpoche's body, she wrote, was excreting oils from its pores, um, which were also collected by uh, students and devotees um, and turned into relics themselves, actually. Uh, the sealant that she was using, she wrote um, in her account, peeled off like saran wrap. Um, so all of these improvisational measures were taken at every turn because nothing really went to plan. Um, and fashioning an object that was meant to last in this fickle, resistant environment meant wrestling on a day-to-day -day basis uh day-to-day -day basis with the prospect of ruin uh the rot of fungal infestation and the corrosive effects of the elements so um working with and against the weight of time the gravity of decay meant continually improvising solutions to anticipated problems so just a master class in problem solving um, and also manipulating raw materials that weren't necessarily meant to remain uh, in the shapes and forms required of them. Uh, and so here we come to a funerary manual that was used by uh, this guild of makers and caretakers um, who found a template in um, a mid 20th century uh, funerary manual. Um, so this manual details the embalming procedure. Um, and this was used by the, the team of makers, this guild, uh, alongside a meditation manual, a sadhana, that was also kind of leveraged in creative ways. So let's back up a bit. Um, 50 years earlier to December 1933. Uh, when Ling Rinpoche himself was tasked with overseeing the funerary arrangements of the 13th Dalai Lama on the eve of his Parinirvana. Um, despite being, you know, trained and lettered in post-death rituals, Ling Rinpoche um, needed a refresher on the technical aspects of embalming. Um, so he approached his teacher, the Gelugpa scholar Pabongka Dechen Ningpo, who gave him instructions that he had received from his teacher. So there's this kind of uh, reciprocity here from teacher to student, teacher to student. Um, and what we've inherited today is a transcription of this uh, shulen, this kind of Q&A response to inquiry genre, which um, testifies to a living oral tradition, um, as well as written sources about how to handle the remains of the special dead. Um, and so let's get into exactly what this manual um, outlines. Um, 50 years later, uh, these instructions were marshaled by Ling Rinpoche students uh, when he passed away in 1983. Um, and his body relic um, kind of faithfully, uh, in the making of his body relic, um, the steps laid out in Pabonka's playbook were kind of faithfully adhered to. So the manual itself deals um, with the procedure, uh, the steps from drying and cleaning the corpse to adorning it, consecrating it, and enshrining it inside of a reliquary stupa. Um, these steps can be boiled down to these 10, which I've noted here. 
Um, and I'll be focusing uh, today on the first three. So the desiccation, the drying process, using corpse salt, uh, cleansing the body uh, with mercury, nulchu, and arranging the body. Um, and so let's head to the first two stages, drying and cleaning. Um, so these preliminary steps involve the ritualized washing, cleaning, and drying of the corpse. And from the get-go, the image we get is a very salty one. Um, the corpse, Pabonka says, should be completely submerged in a container, a purgam or samatok, of salt for around a year, and new cycle, new salt should be cycled in weekly to replace the old. And here we have a couple of images. Um, I think someone has their their volume on. Oh, okay. Um, and so here we see on the left um, the salt cabinet, the purgam, where Lingyu's body was dried out. Just to show you an example. Of that. Um, so I wanted to zoom in on these embalming salts, these salt relics, and share some kind of initial findings with you about how they've been used across uh, Tibetan material culture. Um, and I'd love to hear from some of you after uh, when we get to the Q&A, you know, what your encounters, if you've had any with um, these salt relics have been like, usually you uh, will receive them as a kind of pilgrimage offering um, if you go to a monastery where their main teacher has been preserved in this way. Um, and so, like I said, salt wears many, many hats. And I've come to see that they can be distributed um, like in my experience as a kind of pilgrimage offering, um, but it also, you know, gains meanings and functions as an embalming agent, which I briefly discussed now, um, but even more so as a ritual object, um, a building material, a contact relic, and a medicinal substance. Um, and this is, you know, a kind of contrived typology, and there's definitely boundaries and overlap among these categories, but um, <laughs> someone is biking on a mountain in the background. <laughs> um, okay, there we go. Um, and so, yeah, I found these categories kind of useful to get at some of the larger questions I've I've been talking about. Um, and let's go through some of these in a little more detail. So Tibetans have used many different embalming agents, like just the elements, uh, leaving a body out to dry in the elements, sand, butter, or barley flour. But um, the history of using salt as a preservative agent, a desiccant, is a long one. Um, in his accounts, very colorful accounts of Tibetan funerary rites in the early 1900s, the British colonial officer Charles Bell noted that when it came to high llamas, um, and I've uh, put the quote, oh, no, let's go back. Yeah. Um, he noted that for embalming purposes, salt known as corpse salt is rubbed in. This draws out, says my informant, the body juices. So the body dries up uh, and is built out again with clay being fashioned and painted after the likeness of the deceased. So preserving the bodies of the Dalai Lamas uh, gained popularity in the 20th century. And as, as we've seen in cases with the 13th Dalai Lama and Ling Rinpoche, salt is continued to be used today by Tibetan, uh, Tibetan Buddhists well into um, 21st centuries in order to preserve the dead. Um, but salt also took on critical religious and political significance um, even earlier, around the turn of the 18th century, when the fifth Dalai Lama uh, passed away in Lhasa in 1682. Um, and just like the Buddha Shakyamuni's uh, body, his entire corpse was wrapped in cotton and placed in a sandalwood casket. Uh, but unlike the Buddha, who was famously cremated, the Great Fifth um, was preserved with salt uh, and then in, entombed as a whole body relic inside a monumental golden stupa. And maybe some of you have even visited um, 
the room of uh, stupas at the Potala Palace in Lhasa. Um, the cat's out of the bag today, but all of this was kept under wraps um, for 15 years, actually, by the Dalai Lama's regent, Desi Sange Gyatso, for about 15 years, um, apart from key personnel. Um, and the Great Fifth's embalming salts took center stage in uh, 1697, when Sange Gyatso finally broke this news to the public about the Great Fifth's death on a winter day in Lhasa. Um, then he commissioned small these small votive images, almost like tzatzas, um, of the Dalai Lama to be made from his embalming salts. Uh, these portraits were actually distributed to everyone assembled at this public announcement ceremony. So there was this mass distribution event where everyone uh, left with a small tzatza portrait um, containing the salt relics of the, the fifth Dalai Lama. Uh, and presumably these miniature replicas, um, which themselves, you know, partake in his essence, could have been worn as protective amulets or used for um, ritual practice as supports uh, displayed on personal shrines or interred within other reliquaries. Um, and it's also, you know, possible that these embossed images in, in Tibetan barku or burku were mass produced um, as a head against public outcry for keeping the Dalai Lama's death a secret for over 15 years. Um, that's one possibility, or maybe a move to instill faith and trust in the Gandan Podrang government during a pretty precarious um, political and power transition. Okay. Um, so Sangye Gyatso describes how these ritual objects were formed and why they're power objects, why they're efficacious. In two speeches, um, he composed around the turn of the 18th century. Uh, and the first is found in, is a letter that we have uh, records of in the biography of the sixth Dalai Lama, uh, along with a karchag, this um, kind of inventory or catalog genre of the Dalai Lama's funerary remains. Um, so both of these speeches were actually read aloud that day at Lhasa's major monasteries. Um, and in both of these letters, the Desi writes that uh, because the Great Fifth's entire corpse was residing in a tomb at the Potala Palace, he intends for these corpse salt portraits to serve as substitutes uh, in lieu of post-cremation relics. And all of this is for the sake of public welfare. Um, he also emphasizes that the embalming salts of the Dalai Lama were the focal ingredient, um, the primary building material that these pressed clay images were made from. But we quickly learned that they were also mixed with a ton of other really interesting ingredients. Um, so some of the Dalai Lama's contact relics like barley grains uh, that belonged to him, um, along with relics of the Buddha, um, and even kind of elemental relics. So <clears throat> earth, water, stones, and herbs sourced from India and other sacred places. Okay. So the Desi cites these different layers of potency that corpse salt has accrued during the years long embalming process, uh, which according to him, began in 1682 and ended in 1695 with the stupa's final consecration. So if intimate contact with the corpse itself wasn't enough, these embalming salts are then supercharged inside of the Dalai Lama's casket uh, by being in such close proximity to this trove of other power objects. Um, so for nearly 14 years, the Dalai Lama's corpse was, um, to borrow a phrase from Jane Bennett, uh, enmeshed in a dense network of relations. So inside his casket, the Great Fifth's corpse uh, co-mingled, you could say, with bits of bone, teeth, hair, and nails of awakened Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, Indian luminaries, Tibetan kings, and religious figures, um, as well as bits of cloth cut from their robes and wood from their staffs. Um, fragments of sacred place were also in the mix, um, including stones, grass, and cuttings from the Bodhi tree, uh, where the Shakyamuni Buddha reached awakening. 
So this casket becomes what Tibetans call a jinten, um, or a repository of blessing and power, um, or what Jane Bennett, uh, an influential kind of new materialist or posthumanist, um, a critical theorist that has really been inspiring to me, she might call this a, a meshwork um, of knotted uh, or a knotted world of vibrant matter um, in which material traces of sacred bodies, places, and times commingle um, in ways that both compound and amplify one another's power, potency, and efficacy. Um, so it's precisely this mixture, this assemblage, uh, this amalgamation that was later upcycled to manufacture um, those portable, distributable images of the Dalai Lama. Now, uh, let's get back to, oh, sorry. This was the slide. I'll give you a moment just to look over some of these terms um, that I was drawing from. So let's get back to Desi Sangye Gyatso. Um, he was a really important, also controversial regent of the Tibetan government, but he was also a driving force behind institutionalizing Tibetan medicine uh, and a famous commentator on foundational um, Tibetan medical texts. And at the request of the Great Fifth, uh, Sangye Gyatso founded Chakpori Medical College in Lhasa in the late 17th century. Um, it's pictured here in this black and white photograph, uh, which allowed medical learning and innovation to flourish in the capital. Um, and very early on, it actually became a major producer of medicine. Um, and in the sixth Dalai Lama's biography, we find glimpses of medicine being prepared from these embalming salts, from the Great Fist embalming salts at Chakpuri. Uh, in one passage, medicinal clay or mendam, which is still a major um, majorly important material ingredient in Tibetan medicine um, were made from embalming salts. And this mendam, this medicinal clay, was billed as Menpe Gyalpo, or the king of medicines. This brings us uh, to the chronicles of a Japanese Buddhist monk, Iwe Kawaguchi, who traveled to Tibet in the early 1900s. Um, in his travelogue, we find more references to how these embalming salts were used. So they had a lot of, apparently a lot of prophylactic and therapeutic uses. Um, and in one of my favorite quotes um, here, he writes, only the wealthy merchants and great patrons of temples may hope through some powerful influence to obtain a small quantity of this precious dirt. The salt is a panacea for the Tibetan who swallows a small dose either by itself or dissolved in water for all kinds of ills that the flesh is heir to, from a slight attack of, the cold, of a cold to a serious case of fatal disease. Whatever medical quality this loathsome compound possesses, one thing is certain, that it exercises a powerful purpose of mental cure. Um, and so aside from the fact that Kawaguchi makes zero attempt to hide uh, kind of his disdain or repulsion for these vulgar Tibetan practices of ingesting relics, um, his observations do help paint a clearer picture of the who, why, and how of corpse salt consumption. So these salts were apparently treated as an all-purpose medicine um, and were pr a prized commodity only available to those with means and access. Um, yeah, so now that we've covered purza or embalming salt in some depth, let's look at let's look at a few other ingredients used in these initial stages of embalming, um, because salt is not the only star. Um, as Pabonka spells out in his manual, mercury is actually another key component of bodily preservation. So mercury or ngulchu, which in Tibetan literally means silver water is administered orally into the mouth uh, via a manufactured metal funnel at these periodic intervals, and it's excreted out the colon. So its primary function here is as a bodily purgative, a kujong, intended to flush out and inhibit the growth of harmful bacteria and parasites. 
um, and I've reproduced some of the passages I, I translated from this manual, which you can read here um, about the instructions for administering mercury into the body. Um, yeah, there's also a quick aside, Tibetans are not the only ones who have used mercury as an effective purgative and antibacterial agent. Um, there are these really interesting archaeological studies that uh, have shown trace amounts of mercury being discovered in the, I'll give two examples very quickly, but in the coffin of a 21 year old, 2100 year old uh, mummified body of a Chinese aristocratic woman uh, known as Lady Dai, and this is super interesting. You can just Google Lady Dai and a ton of really cool, uh, fascinating studies about her excavation will, will pop up, I'm sure. Uh, but also on the body of a 2000 year old mummified princess um, who was excavated in Siberia. Um, just a kind of neat uh, aside to show that mercury is used or has been used um, for millennium uh, with the bodies of elites here, we have an aristocratic woman and a mummified princess um, to kind of cleanse the interior cavities of the body to make it suitable for preservation. Um, in Pabonka's prescribed therapy, milk and mercury go hand in hand. So in this next sequence, milk is used to assess whether the interior of the body has been sufficiently cleansed. Um, this kind of pharmacological processing test marks an important juncture uh, here because if it's deemed successful, um, you move on to the next stages of the process and um, including a series of purification pujas um, and kind of completes the preliminary interventions um, to preserve the body. Um, oh. Okay, there's I just want to highlight this interesting polemical moment here uh, in the text about which purgative should be used. Um, so in this pas passage on the right, we see a reference to a difference of opinion, um, suggesting an existing either scholarly discourse or oral discourse around the practice. So instead of using an herbal or vegetal purgative, a menkijong, as others prescribe, uh, Pabonka reiterates his teacher's insistence on using mercury, probably because it's just more efficacious. Um, but the fact that he doesn't specify exactly what kind of mercury, and there are many, many different kinds of mercury, as you'll see, as one would see in Tibetan Materia Medica, um, this kind of leaves open-endedness uh, or room for specialists to choose from what they have available and improvise, you know, based on their specific circumstances. Mercury is actually, um, it's a heavy metal. Uh, it's not good to accumulate in the body. Um, it's one of the most toxic substances used in Tibetan medicine, uh, soa rigpa and pharmacology. Um, and so medical and ritual interventions are therefore necessary to transform this poison into a potent medicine. Uh, and this idea is captured in a quote I love so much. Um, it's a popular saying among Tibetan medical practitioners. Uh, and I'll read it quickly. The deadliest of the poisons, such as mercury, can be transformed into medicine if one knows the secret of its transformation. The best of medicines, such as sandalwood, can become a life-taking poison if one does not know how to use it properly. So before mercury becomes an effective purgative agent, it must be tamed uh, by processing techniques in, known in Tibetan as dulwa, or taming. So let's get into some of those techniques. While mercury is known to be a deadly poison, it does uh, have therapeutic potential. And so this idea that it is both poison and um, tonic is reflected in two of its many names, one being supreme of all liquids, uh, Kuwe Wangpo, and the other being king of penetration. Um, many Tibetan medical treatises, and some are quite old, dating back to the 13th century, um, and others more connected to Indian Ayurvedic texts, 
have spilled a lot of ink trying to negotiate mercury's toxicity um, and discussing the best ways to handle its uh, toxic elements. Um, these texts often detail elaborate processing techniques for purifying mercury in its raw form. Um, and these methods can actually take many, many years and vary by school and tradition. So if any of you are interested, I've noted a few influential sources uh, here on, on the right. Uh, these texts, along with Materia Medica, express mercury's poisonous nature in terms of its material characteristics. So its heavy, mobile, and adherent properties need to be transformed or tamed to render it safe and effective. And this taming is done uh, via a popular formulation that involves cleaning, uh, cooking, and confronting. So through these technologies, the pharmacologist transmutes the undesired and hazardous elements of mercury so that it, be it can become a potent tonic, uh, one that is light, smooth, liquid, and safe to handle and administer to, to a patient living or or non-living, or you could say a more than living patient. Um, mercury has a lot of mythic and narrative layers to it as well. Um, and this is a fascinating uh, medical tanka that I bring in here today. I, I haven't studied it in depth because it is quite elaborate and, and complicated, but uh, I just wanted to bring it in as a visual to show how perceptions of mercury as both this poison and potent medicine are anchored in uh, mythic origins, in narratives about its mythic origins, um, which can differ according to sources, um, many of which do have Indic precursors. Uh, but one version of this kind of origin story is depicted in this medical tanka painting here, which illustrates how poisons that are featured in Tibetan medical texts um, appeared on earth. So how poisons appeared uh, in our kind of human earthly realm. Um, and the story goes that gods and demons churned this primordial milky ocean of uh, the universe in a battle to acquire um, a vase of immortality, an elixir of immortality that lays at its depths. Um, and so all of their fighting woke up this wrathful creature pictured at the center here in red, uh, a manifestation of poison called Halahala, who was uh, vanquished and subdued by um, reciting mantras. So the demon's body shattered into many, many pieces, which you can see in the image here, um, and I'll show detail in a bit. Um, and so the dismembering, the shattering of his body disseminated these various poisons around the world, including mercury. Um, and here, let me get a detail for you. Um, so this uh, bowl on the middle right, the white bowl, um, there's a green bowl filled with white material, so that's mercury. Um, and so it appears it's connected by this golden thread to the demon's eyes. Um, and I'm still not quite sure. Uh, I have to do more, more work on this image. Um, it's so rich in symbolism, uh, but I just wanted to bring it in briefly here. Um, and so this vase containing the elixir of immortality also emerges from the oceans alongside all of these poisons. Um, and so in the fight over it, one of the demons was killed. Um, and his blood mixed with drops of that elixir, which also fell to earth, giving rise to um, all of these potent substances that can be used as antidotes to poisoning. Um, and so one of the main takeaways I gather from this legend and this uh, visual depiction of the legend is that poisons and medicines uh, hail from the same source. Um, and another theme that is kind of echoed in the Tibetan quote we just looked at is the idea that even the most toxic poison can become a potent medicine if you know how to use it. Um, and the most potent medicine can become a fatal toxin depending on the skill of those who handle them. 
Um, so now that the body's been properly cleaned and dried with salt and mercury, um, but is still supple and mobile enough to be manipulated, it is now primed for Pabonka's third phase. The aim here, he writes, is to fashion the body in a way that it, that's most auspicious for followers, um, so maximally effective. Um, and this direction, this directive led the embalming team to consult um, a version of one of the many sadhanas that envisioned Tsongkhapa as a meditation deity. Um, and not surprisingly, Tsongkhapa, uh, the 14th century founder of the Gelug school, he was also mummified. Um, and so he's held up as an important precedent for, for the tradition. Um, and this meditation manual is not your typical sadhana in that it's specifically associated with Tsongkhapa as a long life deity. Um, so it involves an empowerment with a long life phase and long life pills, which when consumed initiate a kind of guru yoga in which Tsongkhapa dissolves into the practitioner um, who aspires to attain his, uh, and the text says, his Seizinma body, which might refer to his embalmed form. So the sadhana uh, provides this iconographic template um, that caretakers drew from to determine what body position, mudra, attributes, and ritual implements to adopt. Um, and in further research, I definitely want to trace this a bit more to see whether this specific funerary application of a sadhana, whether this is part of a wider pattern um, or a unique example. Uh, but in any event, posing Ling Rinpoche in this imitative way um, infuses his body relic with even greater potency and efficacy, and in a way extends the legacy of past masters into the present um, in very embodied and flesh ways. So other authoritative claims regarding the efficacy, the power of Ling Rinpoche's embalmed body uh, are found in a prayer that the Dalai Lama, the 14th Dalai Lama, wrote for his teacher, uh, Ling Rinpoche's teacher's swift rebirth. This prayer extols the benefits of the body, um, and it was fastened at Ling Rinpoche's heart before his body was uh, sealed under layers of fiberglass and resin and putty and paper mache. Um, and so I'm, I argue that this act uh, intextualizes the body in ways that you know, enhance, inscribe, and legitimate its um, efficacy as a kind of liberative or liberatory object, so an object that can liberate on site. Um, and here is the prayer for his swift rebirth. So I've just bolded the kind of relevant parts uh, for our purposes today, um, where the Dalai Lama says that um, Ling Rinpoche's stately body, which liberates on sight. Um, so here we find this trope of like powerful bodies um, that just liberate through uh, visual encounter, direct visual encounter. Um, so merely seeing the body can just, um, you know, catapult you into a kind of higher uh, or liberative state. Um, and at the end of the poem, he writes, please let he, this solicitation, please let the light of your physical form dawn as our sole refuge and support. So the Dalai Lama's supplication prayer uh, promotes the body's intrinsic power to liberate on site. Um, and this happens regardless of the perceptual acuity or cognitive uh, capacities, or even the intentionality of those who encounter it. Um, because it itself is so is so powerful, but at the same time, his prayer inducts audiences into a certain kind of uh, way of engaging with the body relic um, as a bodily support, a kuten, and a refuge of the highest order. Um, it's touted here as a potential source of liberation for all of us um, that are still trudging through the quote jungle of suffering. So given the intrinsic potency of the relic itself, an object that both literally is the past master and embodies awakened beings of the past, uh, one of the questions I had about this all was why there's a felt need for consecration. Um, so why do you have to consecrate um, 
an object that is inherently so powerful to begin with. Um, and so that's a great topic for, for discussion, but it also raise, raises a lot of important questions about the perfect purpose of ritual. Um, and so I would love to, you know, in later research, look at debates around the justification for consecration um, and exactly how these ritual technologies are perceived to work um, in this context. Uh, so I'll start to wrap up um, and just give you some kind of reflections about this project as a whole. Um, and my project is definitely inspired by thinkers who are emerging from these post-humanist and new materialist schools of thought. Uh, and one of them is Stacey Alimo. Um, and I love this quote. She insists that we immerse within worldly material agencies be because the material world what one might call nature or the environment is never merely an external place, uh, she says, but always and already the very substance of ourselves and others. She also encourages us to, quote, reckon with the strange agencies that interconnect substance, flesh, and place. So this doesn't mean uh, contemplating discrete objects from a safe distance, she says, but instead to think as the very stuff of the ever emergent world. So in the examples I've uh, only begun to share today, um, we've started to take up this challenge by thinking as, with, and through corp salt um, in these various ways. So as a pilgrimage offering, an embalming agent, um, a ritual object, a building material, a contact relic, and a medicine. And embalming salt, purza, um, they move fluidly through these categories, often collapsing them. Um, and in turn, they mediate, they blur, and they reconfigure all kinds of relationships uh, between living and dead, past and present, self and other, human and non-human, or more than human, uh, and nature and culture as well. Um, and so now let's recall what Charles Bell's Tibetan informant tells us that embalming salts, quote, draw out bodily fluids. And to paraphrase uh, the Desi, they are powerful substitutes for the Buddha's relics because they've been intimately associated or enmeshed with the corpse, uh, sometimes for many years. During the embalming process, these salts extract, absorb, retain, and somehow enhance the vital life essence of the master by drawing out its fluids and by extension, it's uh, enfleshed enlightened qualities uh, of that person. This is especially apropos when corpse salts are ingested or imbibed in tonic form by devotees for prophylactic purposes, uh, just like that nun at Tupton Choling told me to do. And so through this intimate act of reincorporation, of ingestion, corpse salt exercises its its own ability to redistribute and diffuse power in unexpected ways. And so in the absence of other kinds of relics of a teacher, uh, their embalming salts gain currency as post-mortem contact relics that both extend and establish a continuity with sacred bodies, sacred spaces, places, and times. Uh, whether isolated or compounded, uh, let's see, worn or ingested, corpse salt gains its own uh, vital pulse, which has the capacity to confer blessings or jinlap. Um, as a re repository of power, a jinten and an edible one, embalming salts allow for movement and transformations across bodies and boundaries um, at vastly different scales. Um, and this is my last slide, I promise. Um, so, as I've come to learn, um, making relics, especially ones involving these high profile figures like the Dalai Lamas or Ling Rinpoche is a process that re requires so much uh, skilled labor, time, material resources, care, consideration, uh, and favorable conditions. It's an art um, that requires a guild made up of specialists who are trained in ritual, medicine, pharmacology, and craft. Um, and 
just a me methodological reflection here, part of my aim in thinking with relics as these emergent forms is to think against the grain of dominant discourse about them. Um, so this discourse is often fixated on their cultural status and legitimacy. Um, sacred objects like relics are often viewed as these finished objects um, that become caught up in these life stories and social interactions of the people who use, consume, uh, and treasure them. Um, and this anthropologist, uh, Timothy Engel, who has been also uh, a really inspirational thinker for me, he writes, these processes of making um, appear swallow up in, pro in objects made. So processes of making appear swallowed up in, in objects made. Um, so what I get from this is that the emphasis on product over process um, obscures the notion that relics are made, not given, like we have seen in this particular cultural context. Um, and they become what they are through a kind of ritual and material set of interventions that I've only uh, glossed today. Um, and so in my talk, I've tried to get beyond this tendency to talk about relics um, in abstract, symbolic and performative terms um, to really like think with the guild of makers who are working with these with bodies with these uh, vital materials um, to construct to manufacture a whole body relic and especially that of Ling Rinpoche um, and also the environmental affordances or conditions that they're engaging with um, in real time. And so what emerges from all of this is a grounded view of the of sacred objects. Um, the sacred is not given or self arisen, but I think it's pretty clear that here at least it's relational it's an emergent process um, and one that requires human effort skillful action care and creativity. Um, so I think we're almost at time um, so i'll wrap that up for now. Um, thanks everyone for all of your attention. Uh, looking forward to any comments and questions. Um, and like I said earlier, I'm definitely curious to hear about any experiences or encounters you've had uh, with these kind of embalming salts or with the special dead, uh, with any kudung or um, whole body relics. Um, so yeah, I think I'll stop sharing screen and just open it up uh, to you all. Thank you so much, Julia. And I see we already have a question in the chat, if you want to uh, maybe read that out for everybody also. Ah. Okay, so this one's coming from Artem. Uh, this is incredible. Oh, thank you so much. Regularly visited the shrine with the body of Tokten Amten in Tashijong, Kampagar. However, unfortunately, I never received any of the blessed substances that you've previously previously mentioned, are there any criteria or particular reasons by which the decision is made to preserve the bodies of certain teachers rather than others? Thank you. So are there any criteria or particular reasons by which the decision is made to preserve the bodies of certain teachers rather than others? Yes. Um, there are there's definitely a range of decision making that goes on behind the scenes um, when a kind of high profile teacher uh, might exhibit signs of passing away or is in the process of passing away. Um, I think disciples, um, students and attendants will kind of get together and consult a teacher who might actually like specify in their last will almost a directive on how to handle their remains so a teacher might have preferences themselves oh thank you javier thanks for joining from guatemala maybe thank you so much um so a teacher might specify how they want their bodies to be handled in perpetuity either usually cremated um or preserved and like i said cremation is definitely um still a Kind of fallback it's it's almost a default and mummification or preservation is uh, definitely the exception it takes a lot of resources a lot of time a lot of skill 
Uh, it's really not easy to do. So many things can go wrong. Um, so cremation is um, the most uh, popular and common way of dealing with a teacher's remains. Um, and that way it produces kind of the classic set of relics that a monastery will um, house in their collection or distribute in certain uh, to certain circles or, or um, uh, yeah. And so I've actually been looking at some uh, namtar or um, biographies of teachers from earlier periods and you see a discrepancy over what they wanted to do with their bodies, um, uh, say cremate, and they get into tension with what students um, desire uh, to do with the body. So um, in certain examples, I've seen Tibetan masters would prefer their bodies to be uh, burnt and students um, have kind of pushed back and say, no, we want to preserve the body. So there's this kind of tension preserved in narrative context, um, which probably goes on, probably plays out today. Um, but I think a lot of these decisions are made in close consultation with with the teacher, um, depending on their community resources um, and what the teacher views as um, the most efficacious. We see this like efficacy calculus, like how how they can benefit um, the most beings or preserve the Buddhist teachings, like the Dalai Lama said in, in one of the writings I mentioned. Um, but here we really see the body being used as this instrument for uh, for benefit. Um, so you can, in these Namtar narratives, you can see a teacher going through the motions of thinking how their body in a posterior form can best benefit, uh, or maximally benefit um, the most amount of, of beings. That's a great question, and I can't wait to do some field work and, and just ask these questions to communities who are dealing with these issues. Um, thanks so much, Artem. I hope that rambling was somewhat helpful. Does anybody have any other questions? If otherwise, I have one. Um, you mentioned uh, sort of the, this transmission of knowledge as far as uh, techniques, technology, whatever you want to call it, goes. I'm wondering if there's any sort of uh, textual source which is the go-to, if perhaps there were any terma revelations or any great master who gave specific instructions, would there be one sort of main, like the Bardo Todro could be, for example, for the dead? Uh, would there be an equivalent in this world of embalming uh, one sort of go-to source? Yeah, so the Bardo Todro doesn't, it's, it's more of a kind of liturgical program than instructions for handling uh for this specific case of preserving a body so these technical instructions um i think were kind of hard to come by and there was no like or text um or uh kind of authoritative go-to source because if there were um the dalai lamas would have had access to them and um preserving the body of ling rinpoche the team of caretakers responsible for that would have either known or had access to a source like that. Um, and so what they did was uh, go back to this um, very short two and a half folio uh, manual by Pabunka Dechen Ningpo. Um, and so that I've seen has been, um, has been the source that is turned to um, for how to preserve, like the technical aspects of how to preserve uh, the bodies of the special dead, but there's a, a few dissertations out there um, that have some ethnography and some interviews with Tibetan um, attendants who are responsible for um, preserving the body of Ling Rinpoche, and they mention a few other um, texts called uh, Purchoki Lachlan. Um, and so these are like corpse rites. And so I think those were used in tandem with texts like Pabonka's. Um, to inform like what kind of pujas should be used um, and how to actually handle how to handle the body um, 
yeah, have you heard anecdotally or seen, I don't know, in your research, any any texts that deal with like how to how to preserve the bodies of the special dead? I haven't no. seen anything in, in Terma really mm-hmm. should ask. Um, I think a lot of this is actually passed on orally. And so Pabonka's funerary manual, his embalming instructions are kind of one of the few resources I've been able to find, but I'm still looking. Right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or musings? Do you have anything else you'd like to add, Julia, if we have no questions? Mm, um, maybe just a note about how important, uh, like combining textual work and eth- ethnographic work is. So a lot of these questions you can ask of the text, but they have very real limitations. So always consulting, you know, living masters of the tradition and uh, people who continue these uh, traditions of bodily preservation. So that's going to happen at a later stage when I'm finished with coursework here in California. But um, yeah, I have so many questions to ask of people who actually um, oversee this process. And a lot of these questions I've been asking of the textual material I've been working on and just keep like bumping into dead ends. But um, like, a yeah, just to see, maybe even observe um, how a body is, moves through this process um, because a lot of the times mummification will be used not as an ends in itself, but just a means to preserve a teacher before um, the cremation happens. So if it's a high profile teacher who's gonna have like a really elaborate funeral, um, the body might be preserved temporarily for a few weeks, even a few years while all of those arrangements are happening. So I think that'll be a great time to like poke around and ask people um, like how they're handling all all of these questions that come up, like very real questions about uh, treating the the bodies of their teachers. Yeah. Right. Well, then thank you, Julia. Thank you so much for your very interesting and uh, broad overview. Oh, I see another question coming now. The chat for you. Thank you, Artem. So, personal question: How has interacting with Kudum affected you personally? What feelings did you experience? That is a great question and one that kind of drives all of this research, Artem. This, um, you know, my academic uh, and. Um, kind of intellectual pursuits are all trying to unpack in a way uh, what it was that I felt um, when experiencing the preserve, the kudung of um, Trulshi Karimpeche um, and encountering relics in my travels to, to Kathmandu and parts of Nepal and, and in Dharamsala in India. Um, like I said earlier, and maybe you've experienced this yourself, relics are kind of ubiquitous in the uh, Buddhist world, but whole body relics are are pretty rare to encounter, relatively speaking, and it's it's quite visceral when you you know walk into a lakang, a prayer hall, and you see um, the gilded preserved body of um, a teacher or founder of that monastery, and there's just like a real kind of felt environment of of devotion and awe. Um, but also of shock too. Um, it just kind of disrupts, you know, your ordinary ways of moving uh, through spaces. Um, and that prayer hall where the body of Trulshik Rinpoche is um, installed inside of a main um, stupa there, um, the whole space is kind of dominated by his preserved body. So it, it is the focal point. It's like the, gra- the center of gravity there. Um, and for me, there's just a lot of, uh, yeah, like shock is kind of one way to put it, shock and like a confrontation with um, with Im- impermanence on the one hand, like the inevitability of death, but also this effort to, um, to preserve 
Um, so there is this like element of pushing back against impermanence. You have the preserved body of a teacher. Um, so one time you're kind of like reflecting on maybe your own mortality, but also um, in a way looking at things that transcend like the uh, maybe a, a human life, um, like the pres the longevity of the Buddhist teachings, for example. Um, but also maybe one other thing is like, yeah, shock and awestruck, but there is this like not not an element of disgust or horror, but maybe more of fascination. So this captivation, um, like something that your mind can't really wrap its like your ordinary mind can't wrap your head around. So for me, that fascination, that intrigue was like an opening kind of to exploring more um, and maybe a reflection of how the body is used um, as an instrument of skillful means. Um, and I think these are very like personal and individual encounters and everyone would encounter the body of a teacher differently. But um, yeah, those are just some of my reflections and um, yeah, being able to take away a piece of that person um, and consume a piece of that like awakened body. That's really something um, like you don't encounter that a lot in everyday life. So those are kind of just instances that stuck with me and have prompted like years of thinking and researching and um, reflection. So it's been very generative. I hope that is a decent response, but I, I could go on and on, but I've never talked for so long actually. <laughs> um, so I think I'll stop there. Yeah, thank you so much for your question. Really, it means a lot. There's one more question for you in the chat now. Do you know what Omri, this brown or black powder has as ingredients? I heard also in that part. Amrita, like, uh, hmm. brown or black powder. I'm Robert. I'm not exact. Is this a medicinal, a common medicinal substance, or amrita is in like nectar of immortality? Is this used in Tibetan medicine? Um, I know a lot of Tibetan medical uh, pills um, and Tibetan medicines incorporate the remains of of masters like parts of ashes uh, cremation ashes or certain relics um, so that's actually pretty a common like foundational ingredient um, i mean it could be as much as a grain of, of sand that's been kind of diluted and distributed across uh tibetan medicines but jamyang you probably know a little bit more about that wouldn't you well, as you say, they, they do add it in certain recipes as a, uh, I think, more as a blessing substance. There's always this idea sort of the of, of, of sort of potency of the ingredient per se, and then there's the blessing and the mantric empowerment, etc. So I think as a... Um, mm. uh, in the top, for example, yeah, there can be. I mean, you hear about these famous ancient pills of the finger of the great master or the nails or the hair they sort of use those compounds as far as i know but i never looked at any specific recipes so what i need to sure yeah i'll definitely ask around i'll ask around yeah thanks so much robert or maybe okay, next Julia, thank you so much then yeah, of course. Thank you for having me. And thank you, and thank you everybody for joining us.